Hello and welcome to TVP Stories. This is a new Facebook Live series that gives you an insight into Thames Valley Police. And we kicked off the series last year with the Chief Constable, and tonight I'm delighted to be joined by the Head of Major Crime, Detective Superintendent Ian Hunter. Good evening, James. Good evening. Good evening to everyone joining us. And Ian will be taking your questions. If you do have a question, put it in the comments section. We'll get to as many as we can. Thank you to those that have already put their questions forward. So tonight we'll be split into two sections. Firstly, we'll be looking at major crime, their investigations and Ian's career. And secondly, we'll be looking at how detectives investigate a murder. But first of all, Ian, it'd be good to know how you joined the, the police force. So my early years were spent uh, on a farm, part of a hard-working farming family. Uh, and that gave me a real sense of adventure, to be honest. Uh, I enjoyed sport, I played a lot of football and cricket, uh, and that kind of took me in a direction um, towards the military. I always, I always really wanted a military career at that stage. Um, I wasn't particularly academic at school, I didn't work hard enough, uh, or as hard as I should have done. Uh, probably not the best role model, to be fair. Um, but I ended up joining the Royal Navy uh, when I was uh, 17, and uh, served in the first Gulf War in 1991, and in the former Yugoslavia a couple of years later. Uh, really enjoyed the, the camaraderie, the teamwork, uh, the travel, uh, and actually had some great times. It was really kind to me, that's where I met my wife. Uh, and on leaving after six years, I was looking for another career that would give me that, uh, that sense of adventure, um, real kind of diverse career with different opportunities, etc. So the police really was the only option for me uh, at that time. I was really keen to do that. Uh, and I was accepted by Thames Valley Police and joined in June 1998. And then you became a detective? I did, yeah. So I spent two years at Milton Keynes as a uniformed police officer. Really enjoyed working there, really busy. Um, but I knew that I was particularly enjoying investigating the more serious crimes. And so uh, I went on an attachment uh, to CID as a probationer at that time. And, you know, that made my mind up. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, was working on some really serious crimes. Uh, and was fortunate to get selected for a position at that time. Uh, so joined as a detective constable uh, in Milton Keynes, uh, and then since then I've stayed as a detective um, at every rank, so I'm really pleased with that, having, having done uniform and um, detective, and that's something I'm really proud of. And now head of Major Crime Unit. Can you explain what the Major Crime Unit is? So yes, yeah, so uh, the Major Crime Unit are there to investigate some of the most serious crimes that we have. So uh, we investigate uh, murders, uh, manslaughters, um, we also uh, have the responsibility for the initial response into kidnap and crimes in action uh, as well. So, um, in addition, we would investigate any other uh, crimes that would benefit from setting up of a, a major crime unit investigation. Uh, they could in include kind of corporate manslaughters, uh, child sex, uh, sexual exploitation or firearms offences. And there are many ways now to become a detective. Yes, so you've got the traditional route that I took, the police constable to detective constable. Um, that's the route that's still traditionally there. We're always looking for more police constables to become detective constables and join us in the detective side of things. Um, there's also, uh, we've tried recently, uh, the force of trial, and other forces actually around the country, have trialled a, a specialist entry detective, which looks to reduce the amount of time when people come into our organisation as a police officer before they get to become a detective. Um, we've tried that with about 60 people. A lot of those are in training just now. So we've just pressed pause on the recruitment for now to see how that works out um, and you know what the evidence is that to say how that's worked uh, for us. Um, but it's likely that that will uh, become another route for us in due course as well. And of course, it's not just about being a detective now in terms of the investigative world. Uh, we have lots of opportunities for police staff investigators. So those people that perhaps don't want to be a police officer but want to be involved in investigations. There's a lot of varied roles that we might touch on later on in terms of becoming a, an investigator in the police as well. And we're going to take some of your questions now. Um, Susan asks, why are offenders often bailed? So from a major crime perspective, actually it's quite rare that the offenders are bailed in cases of murder, for example. Um, we would do all that we can to investigate thoroughly. Um, and if we arrest a suspect, we would try our hardest if they're the right person to you know, gravitate through to um, charging that individual. But on occasions, there are reasons why you would need to bail. Um, that might be that at that stage, there's insufficient um, evidence to charge at that stage. There might be a number of further inquiries that are left to do. And traditionally, that might be things like forensic results that are awaited. We might need medical statements and better understanding about how somebody died. 
uh, we might have some witness, outst witness statements outstanding, or indeed just the sheer amount of technology now. Some of that needs to be reviewed and assessed. Um, but of course, on, on serious cases, even if we, we're bailing somebody, we can put really tight bail conditions on to make sure that we are looking after um, any potential uh, witnesses, etc., or to keep people away from a particular area. And some of the viewers have also asked and are concerned about the UK murder rate, which we've seen a rise recently. Yeah, so um, last week uh, saw the uh, latest figures released for homicide rates in England and Wales. So up until uh, September 2018, that's the 12-month period, and there has been an increase. It's increased from 649 in the year before to 739 in the last 12-month period. Remember, though, this is for England and Wales. Um, that's an increase of 14%, uh, and that's the highest level since 2007. So, of course, that's really, really concerning for a number of people, and I understand that. But let's put it into the context within Thames Valley. During that same period, we had 17 offences which is about the average that we would expect over the last kind of five-year period, really. So um, I'm pleased that we haven't seen the incre increase that have happened elsewhere uh, in the country, but we're not complacent and working really, really hard to take away those kind of opportunities and all of the risks that are involved in, um, in homicide. Um, Brian asks, he's obviously a fan of uh, Luther, I don't know if you've watched that, but is it OK for detectives to befriend serial killers? No, never. No. Um, to reassure, we don't have you know, many serial killers. That's a really good thing uh, in the UK. Um, I'm not a great watcher of TV dramas, but uh, no, that would never be, never be acceptable. Um, Bev asks, my daughter would like to get into the police. Um, do you think an apprenticeship is a good start? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. It's great to see uh, kind of young people wanting to, to join um, our organisation. Um, I think apprenticeships are a really valuable way uh, of joining our organisation. And increasingly, we've got more apprenticeships now. Um, starting actually with police officers, that's going to be uh, ahead of us as well. So a new route to uh, uh, you know, join the organisation. In effect, people are going to be able to earn as they learn, which I think is, is fantastic. Um, there's also a number of different apprenticeships in other parts of um, the organisation as well. So um, really encourage people to look at the Thames Valley Police website, look at the, speak to the careers teams and look at those opportunities. Um, a question here from Abby. Uh, what's your greatest hurdle in policing? Wow, there, there are many hurdles in policing. Um, it's a really, really challenging, demanding environment. Demand is really high for us. That's the first thing. Um, you know, we get, you know, a huge amount of demand for all manner of things. Um, so quite clearly, um, we've got to be able to respond effectively uh, and respond to the kind of community needs. That's always a challenge for us. Um, but there's plenty of hurdles along the way. We, of course, we want our the information to come in about what's happening in local communities. We want people to support our investigations. Bringing that into a major crime context, I'm really keen that people who have seen something happen have the confidence to tell us what's happened and then, of course, give the evidence at court as well. But any number of other hurdles, that could be you know, the, the, the proliferation of data nowadays. You know, huge amounts of data on everybody's phones and laptops and, and that becomes really difficult for us to understand in an investigation context as well. Um, a question from Adam, Adam, is Brexit going to alter information shared between countries and police forces in other countries? Um, we're preparing for all eventualities, it would be fair to say. Thames Valley Police have got dedicated officers that are looking at the impact of Brexit on policing. Uh, so, uh, of course, there's, there's some way to go till we decide you know, what's going to happen there. Um, but we're looking at all eventualities and making plans accordingly. Um, Hannah asks, um, what's the most rewarding part of your job? I mean, lots of policing is really rewarding. Um, uh, for me, personally, um, as a detective, uh, I think it's when you've run an investigation, you've taken it to court, um, the moment for me when a jury come back in with their verdict is just a really exhilarating time because you want all of your hard work um, to be, uh, you know, to have a positive outcome. You want someone that's done this bad thing um, to be convicted for that. And of course, if we got to that stage at court, that's what we believe. Um, so, of course, it's very satisfying when you get those outcomes and people who have done really bad things are locked up for a long time. Uh, that's being a detective. Um, but for me, the most rewarding is when you're able to provide some reassurance to the families of victims and victims themselves in other cases outside of murder. Um, that's really what we're here for. 
um, and to, to just try and make a bit of difference to their life um, is hugely rewarding. And now head of major crime, is this your dream job? Yeah, it sounds a bit corny, I suppose, but yeah, it absolutely is. Um, I, I love being a de detective, really proud to be a detective. Um, and having worked in major crime as a detective chief inspector previously, the opportunity to come back and be the head of the major crime unit is an absolute privilege. Um, I, I don't think there can be a, a greater um, honour, really, than be to ask to lead the investigations into the deaths of people. Um, on behalf of their, their families and to make sure that we get justice, not only for them, but for society um, in general. Um, and I'm really, really lucky and privileged to lead a, a really motivated team. Uh, I mean, the major crime unit in Thames Valley, um, the experience, they're professional, highly capable, and, uh, you know, it's a real privilege to lead them. And your job and the job of your colleagues is a matter of life and death, isn't it? Um, yeah, it can be. I mean, of course, when we're responding to a homicide... Um, those type of offences, it's obviously a reactive investigation that we're trying to piece together, get to the truth, find out who's responsible, su support the families and make sure that there's justice. So that's largely reactive. But on the other side of our business, we deal with the crimes in action, the kidnaps. Um, thankfully, they're rare, um, but we have uh, senior investigation officers uh, on my team, uh, I'm included amongst those, on duty 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, they will always have their phones on them, always ready to respond. And of course, those type of situations are very imprecise. We're often working with incomplete information. We don't really know exactly what's going on. So the SIO is trying to kind of piece that together and prevent harm happening. That's the clear objective there at that stage. And the work of the Major Crime Unit was displayed in a recent series, Catching a Killer. Uh, by True Vision on Channel 4. What did you make of those programmes? Yeah, I, I thought they were exceptional, in all honesty. Um, I think they really captured the kind of essence and the reality of life in major crime. Uh, they showed the, the stresses, the challenges, the frustrations, sometimes the euphoria um, of making a breakthrough. Um, it showed the really detailed work of our family liaison officers and you know how they work from the initial stages with the, the families of those who are victims and, and how difficult that is. Uh, they show the ups and downs of during the investigation. And I think that that's, of course, real life. And that's the reality. It's always a journey on all of these investigations. So I thought they captured it superbly well. And is it hard for a detective to find that work-life balance? Uh, yeah, it can be. Yeah, it can be. The reality is we deal with some really distressing and difficult situations. And, um, of course, we, we, we're just ordinary people. In reality, so that affects us as well as it does uh, other people. Um, trying to strike the work-life balance is important because we don't know when the demand is coming. Um, I have my phone with me 24/7, um, apart from if I'm out for the odd run. Um, so you're waiting for the phone to ring, and that puts a certain demand on you as well in terms of your your work-life balance. We encourage our staff to have a really effective kind of balance between uh, between it. But of course, when you're waiting for something to happen. Um, you know, that can impact uh, in, in a number of ways. And when we have an incident, we, as I said, we work long hours. It's unpredictable. It's often through weekends, and that can impact on people's days off, um, events, birthday events, all sorts of different things, and even people's annual leave that's been known that people cancel that. Um, we're going to take some of your questions again. Uh, Beryl asks, why don't the Major Crime Unit get many results? Oh, I'm disappointed. Beryl would say that. I, what, my answer to that would be, um, just look at this year, look at 2019, what we're four weeks into the year. So far in the trials that have concluded, um, we've had seven people convicted, four life sentences and 95 years in sentences given out for a range of offences, murder, manslaughter, rape, um, firearms offences uh, as well, um, you know, child sex exploitation. They are notable crimes. Um, and I'd also say that major crime investigate and successfully detect 95% of all of our murders in Thames Valley Police. Um, that's above the national average, something I'm really proud of our team uh, and Thames Valley Police for delivering. So for me, the question is more about how can we get that message across to people like there or to make sure she's got that confidence that, that we are detecting those crimes. Um, same question from um, Dubs, LF and Emily. Um, the drop in number of police officers, is that worrying for you? Does that affect the work of the major crime unit? Uh, Thames Valley uh, Police have continued to really invest in major crime. We've, 
We've gone through a, a modernisation over the last year and a half where uh, we've changed the kind of the shape of the department really to bring in um, new teams. We're now 50-50 in terms of police staff, police officers. Um, we've got police staff who uh, run our CCTV, for example. There are all of our disclosure officers, our exhibit officers, and our highly valued staff that are, do our indexing and our typing of our, our support system as well. So, you know, the, the reality is... Um, it's a really diverse department within major crime uh, nowadays as well. And um, we've got a question from Belinda. Um, what is done to protect children from county lines? I don't know if you can answer that or have a view on, on that. Yeah, so county lines, um, some, some people watching this might have seen in the news this week. Last week there was a real intensification week in Thames Valley and indeed nationally. Um, to look at this, the threat that's posed from county lines... So these are people who are trying to come out often from the bigger cities and you know, bring the drugs market to more local areas. And often they prey on vulnerable people uh, within our communities. So um, last week saw a real intensive week of activity. And, and some of the results were fantastic. You know, there was 106 arrests, um, over 100 people stop and searched. 147 uh, mobile phones taken off the streets uh, off these people. Uh, weapons seized, over 30 weapons, £133,000 recovered as well. I mean, these are tremendous results. So there's a lot being done. That's just in that week, but over and covert activity continues all the time. Um, Nicola asks, um, what crime in your career has had the most impact on you? Um, a, a number of crimes uh, would have had an impact. Um, some of them, I don't think, will ever leave me, to be fair, um, of, of what you end up dealing with. Um, quite possibly, the case we're going to speak about a little bit later on, really, um, involved a child murder. I think that's probably had a, a significant impact as well. Um, Dominic asks, um, how often is major crime involved with cyber crime? So, um, not, not that often, in all honesty. The type of offences we're investigating doesn't link across to cyber too much. Um, Thames Valley got a specialist unit that will look at cyber crime, and that's part of our um, serious and organised crime uh, unit. Uh, and also, there's regional kind of collaborations around cyber as well. But it's great to know that we've got you know a good level of expertise, a good level of knowledge that we can tap into when we need to, uh, particularly around the covert area of policing. Um, Neil asks, um, how can the community get involved and support the work of the major crime unit? I mean, communities are vital for all of policing. You know, um, the information that communities provide help us to understand what crimes are happening, who's responsible for them, and what do things look like. So our neighbourhood, kind of the bedrock of policing, really, neighbourhood policing. Um, so local people sharing information um, directly with the police or through, you know, charities like Crime Stoppers is really, really important. Um, it helps us to know where we should be directing our resources and, and how we can take things forward. And of course, from a major crime aspect, if we're putting out you know, requests for information, if people have seen anything, if people have heard of something, sometimes people think oh, well, it's only a small bit of information. But it might just be that really important part of a jigsaw that can help solve some of these crimes. Stephen asks, what's your definition of major crime? My definition of major crime? Um, I think, as I described earlier, that's kind of the right side for us really. So we'll, we'll look at that, that murder, manslaughter or any of those really, really serious offences that we can add value. Proportionately, we're quite a small team in reality. We've got a less, less than 100 officers and staff. So we've got a lot of other really, really experienced detectives within our, um, within our force. They might be working in child abuse, domestic abuse, in our force CID that also investigate really serious crimes and get some fantastic outcomes as well. So I kind of look at it to say, well, what is the, vad the, the, um, the value that is added by major crime becoming involved um, before we would, we would look at you know, how do we assist? Michael asks, um, would, uh, uh, would forces like TVP benefit from a centralised national CCTV agency? Um, interesting question. Um, CCTV is an interesting one. I'm, I'm not sure a national solution would be the right way to go. Uh, we know we see far more CCTV than we've ever seen before. Um, in the past, there used to be a couple of cameras when I was growing up, maybe in a kind of town centre, that type of thing. But now when you imagine CCTV, it's all around us. You know, people have got it on their dash cams, it's on cyclist head cams, etc. Um, you will see it on buses, you will see it on lorries, delivery lorries, etc. 
Lots of houses have it now as part of their doorbell system, for example. So there's, there's a huge amount of it. Um, a national solution, very expensive. Would it deliver? Probably not. Um, however, what we've done locally is look at the challenges around CCTV, but also understand that it contributes a significant part to many, many of our investigations and successful outcomes. So we recruited a dedicated team within major crime of uh, staff to, to deal with CCTV. Um, many of them are new into policing, hadn't worked in policing before, um, and they'll be responsible for scoping what CCTV we might have. They'll do the retrieving of it, they'll do the viewing of it, and they'll later on present that at court as well. I, I think it's quite remarkable, really. We've got a member of staff um, that's been with us 13, 14 months, and only two weeks ago was in the Crown Court giving crucial evidence in a murder case, a successful murder case, um, and then was commended by the judge. So I think that kind of shows that the different recruitment uh, opportunities that we have now, really interesting area to work, um, and uh, you know, I'd encourage people to think about those careers as well in the future. Um, one of our media officers, Louisa Ma, spent some time with DCI Stuart Blake looking at the advances in CCTV. What the staff doing here is, is that um, in an initial inquiry, when there is where there's, um, CCTV available, um, the, the senior resident officer will outline the parameters of, of um, the CCTV timescales, uh, and then this team um, will then go out, they'll scope around the area to see what CCTV uh, capabilities or, or opportunities there are, uh, and then they will do the necessary downloading, come into a, a suite similar to this, uh, we've got three suites across across the unit, one in Oxfordshire, one in Aylesbury and one in, um, in Tapman to cover the three counties and then they'll start processing all that, all that CCTV. CCTV is everywhere, passive data is out there um, and it, and it it's a, plays a huge part in our investigations. We've got uh, three coordinators uh, and six viewers so uh, across the three sites so, um, so it's, it's not a big team but collectively they, they, they get through a huge amount of work. I mean, just in the last 12 months they've processed something in the range of 15,000 hours worth of CCTV across the investigations that we've been involved in. The most important part of it is prioritising what we view. Um, what, whilst we've got it, we don't necessarily have to view it all. Uh, and that's the decisions that we, we have to make, very careful decisions that we make. But yeah, 15,000 hours worth of CCTV viewing that previously would have, would have been done by police officers. Um, so so, so you know, it's, it's a huge amount of work that they do for us. The initial response will be very much guided by whoever's in charge of the investigation. Um, so, so we will be looking to try and maximise the CCTV opportunities to understand what's happened. If the incident itself is covered by CCTV, that's going to be our starting point to understand what, what has exactly happened. But there's been many cases in the last couple of years that without CCTV, it would have been a very difficult, very difficult for us in the investigation team to actually prove what, what's happened. Um, you know, it doesn't always answer all the questions, uh, but it, had, it plays a huge part in, in modern investigations. recently with the FBI? Yeah, chance of a lifetime to be fair. Um, I was really privileged to be selected to represent both Thames Valley Police and UK Policing over at uh, Quantico uh, in Virginia, which is the FBI National Academy, uh, which is a 10-week FBI funded, they, they pay for it. Uh, and it's a course of um, three things really, academic study uh, with the University of Virginia and uh, enrichment events, so lots of uh, presentations and talks about different uh, events that happened in the US and across the world, uh, and also networking. Uh, there were 220 of us, 27 different countries, so a remarkable experience to understand more about policing and contribute how UK policing does, does our business as well. Uh, so uh, very, very fortunate and, uh, as I said, uh, just a really enjoyable experience. And having sort of seen the way it's done in other countries, how do you reflect on UK policing? So, I mean, policing is so different around the world. Uh, you know, it will depend on the politics and the culture and the finance of the country. And, and you know, the, the policing model will be very different. Um, I was actually quite surprised and taken about how many countries base their policing model on the UK uh, and really look back to even our Pelian principles, if you like, as the kind of the founding direction of, of, of policing. Um, so how does it, um, you know, detective-wise... Um, I think the way we're structured, the way we train our detectives, the way we accredit our detectives is world leading. And I don't say that lightly, um, but I certainly wouldn't be swapping um, the role of policing in the UK with any other country. I think we, we, we do a really good job. 
and we're going to go to some more of your questions. Um, Miriam asks, um, do you think sentences always reflect the seriousness of crimes? So um, within major crime, uh, we're dealing with, you know, some of the most serious offences. So on conviction, um, you're looking at life sentences. Um, but of course, there are minimum terms in terms uh, in, in, with regards to how long people actually serve in prison. Um, I think that that provides that balance between making sure people are punished and punished for a long time when they've done something so terribly wrong, but also looks at rehabilitation after that period of time. And if people breach that, they can be recalled straight back to prison. But I also accept the view and, and the argument that says, you know, some of those sentences should be longer. Um, but that's really a matter for courts and judges. Um, Bailey asks, um, would you agree this country has one of the best police services in the world? Yes. No, it, it, yeah, I do. I absolutely do. Having, having seen and spoken to colleagues, um, I think on balance, uh, I know a lot of people watching this perhaps won't always agree with that. But those that have travelled around the world and gone to different places and seen different policing styles, um, of course I'm biased. I accept that. But I think we've got an awful lot to be proud of in this country. Alexandra asks, um, what do you see, see as the key attributes required in becoming a major crime detective? So, major crime detective, um, firstly, uh, police officers and police staff, wh what I really look for in people is that, um, that passion, that desire to do a really, really good job. Uh, somebody who's going to work hard, be reliable, etc. Um, I also want people who are kind, caring, compassionate, um, able to listen to the concerns of, kind of victims and their families, etc. Um, coming into a major crime environment, uh, we would take often very experienced detectives who have worked in other parts of our, our business or police staff who have got a lot of relevant experience to come into us, as well as, you know, brand new people. But I'm looking for people who are meticulous, have got a real eye for detail, um, have got a real desire to kind of work as part of a team. I think they're all the kind of values and the behaviours that I look for in, in teams. And, and actually, they're skills that, if you look across work, the, the wider working world, that's what a lot of managers would look for, I guess. Hannah asks, um, you mentioned about staffing. Um, do you need prior knowledge, experience in policing to apply for these roles? So I'm presuming uh, she's talking about some of the roles I've talked about, things like CCTV. Um, lots of our CCTV team did not have prior policing knowledge. Um, so there's no requirement for that. Even coming in, we've, we've had a lot of staff come in as our indexers and our typists, and it brings them into the major crime world. It enables them to have a look at policing and understand what it's about. Uh, I know some of our staff are having interviews to join to become police officers. Uh, a lot of our staff move on to other police staff positions in, in different areas. So um, it's, not a, it's not a prerequisite. No, it's not. Um, it's more about people's values and behaviours. That's what we're really looking for. Maggie asks, um, do you feel that the current government um, appreciate the work of police forces? Uh, I think in the whole they do, yes. Um, I, I think policing is well supported by, um, I would suggest, the silent majority. It's, it's always uh, difficult because you will see a lot of criticism of policing, sometimes, rightly so. Um, we're not always going to get everything right. We're human beings, we make mistakes. Um, I make mistakes all the time. That's just real life and that's reality. But, you know, I think we've got a lot to be proud of. Our, our police officers work really, really hard. Um, the reality is that, you know, and a lot of people watching might say, well, I phoned the police and it took a long time for people to turn up. I can reassure people, our police officers and police staff, they want to be at the right place and the right time. They want to protect people. They want to prevent offences from taking place. They want to arrest people that are doing bad things. Um, but the demand is often so high they can't get everywhere as soon as they want to. But that's most often the case, that they're needed somewhere else more, and it's a case of prioritisation. Um, of course, I would always like more resources, as, as, we've, uh, as we've mentioned, um, uh, and, and I think that's you know, for communities and societies to decide what sort of police force they want, really, uh, rather than me talking about the kind of politics of it. And uh, Jones Moans on Twitter asks, of all the detective dramas... Which is the closest to reality? Well, as I said, I, I don't really spend my time. I'm often found either at uh, uh, Park Run or my running club out of, out of uh, work hours rather than um, watching TV dramas. It would be a bit like a busman's holiday, really. Um, I, I dare say that not many of them uh, would be that accurate. 
Uh, I'm quite embarrassed to say I haven't even watched an episode of, of Morse. And, and being a Thames Valley detective, that's, uh, that's not great. Um, I, I would point to some of the, um, the real-life scenarios that we've had. We talked about True Vision and Catching the Killer. Um, that's what the reality is. But, of course, people are going to watch drama for the entertainment of it. It doesn't have to be reality, and, and I accept that entirely. And many of you asking about welfare, and we spent some time with Ian in the Major Crime Unit looking at how they deal with the well-being of their officers and staff. This is a well-being room for our staff. It uh, came about as a request from one of our, the members of our team who uh, really does champion the uh, fact that we need to make sure we look after our staff and I'm 100% supportive of that. Our teams work often very long hours. It can be some really distressing and horrific uh, issues that we deal with. Of course, that's what you'd expect for a major crime unit. Very different to the traditional um, policing uh, offices that I would have seen over my kind of 21 years in the police. Um, but actually, why not try it? Why not, you know, see if it can have a positive impact on, on people's wellbeing? We're talking about major crime here. There are some harrowing bits of evidence, bits of information that, that officers and staff are, are looking at and dealing with. Are you finding that the people are taking advantage of, of having this room? It's early stages, you know, this has only been here, um, you know, a, a, a short couple of weeks really. Um, but I've got to reflect on the fact that major crime now is 50% police officers and 50% police staff. 50% um, of our staff are male, 50% are female. Um, and yes, we've got some very, very experienced officers, experienced detectives and staff that have been with us a long, long time. But other people are very new into policing. Um, you talked to our CCTV unit before. Uh, some of those have only been with us a year. No previous experience of policing. So, of course, when they're looking at some quite horrific material, I want to pr provide a space where they're comfortable to go just to unwind a little bit. Um, and actually, I think we've got to try new methods such as this. Um, to encourage our staff to think about their well-being uh, and make sure that the long careers and the difficult situations they deal with um, you know, don't become too stressful. And of course we've got the blue light champion uh, as well, uh, which I believe was in involved in. Yeah, and they've been magnificent. They've been absolutely fantastic in really changing the culture of policing to, to kind of soften that style and make it uh, more okay to say that you've got a problem or you're finding something um, really difficult. And the team aspect of major crime um, is absolutely huge. You know, um, as I said, we work long hours, uh, we work on some really, really difficult cases, uh, so to have suitable spaces is, is, is for me, um, a, a really um, sensible way forward. Okay, and now back to your questions. Um, Bailey asks, how do you cope with the role and how it impacts on your home life? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I try and separate my... Um, my work life from my family life. Um, I don't. Um, I don't actually socialise a great deal with police officers outside of work. I like to uh, spend time with my family. That's really, really important to me. Um, love my sport, as I said before, uh, and do a lot of running. Um, so I, I kind of my thinking time and my escape, uh, I guess, from my work is a lot of running. I do a lot of marathon running, etc. So I think that's probably how I separate things um, away, really. I think that's a healthy thing to do. I think it's really, really difficult to take your work home with you all the time. The phone is always there, but being able to kind of switch on and switch off from work, I think is really important. Um, Simon asks, um, his daughter's got an appointment actually to join as a special. Um, do you think this will help her decide whether she should join as a police officer? Yeah, I think it can only help really. Uh, fantastic and well done for joining the special constabulary. Uh, really, really valued um, group of people that provides us with extra resource, um, and you know the, the amount of hours they do, um, not always seen by the general public, but fantastic. Um, I think they can get a lot of life skills out of that as well, and uh, you know new experiences. Um, but of course, it is an opportunity for people to have a good look at policing from the inside, um, understand more about the role, and choose whether that's the career for them. David asks, um, your experience with the FBI, how has that helped you in your role with major crime? So when I um, when I did the academic side of things, I did um, violent crime behavioural science and crisis negotiation. I thought they were the three areas that were close, most closely aligned to my work. So it's given me a real insight into a lot more of the, the very serious crime that we hope doesn't come back to the UK. Um, but you know the, the studies that we did around behavioural science, serial killers, etc., was really, really interesting. That's given me a lot of links um, in terms of the behavioural science unit in the FBI, which um, I've already used. Uh, I've also had that network of people that I talked about 
I've got about 240 people now from my course that I can just pick up the phone to. But in addition to that, there's 50,000 people that have done the FBI National Academy. And that creates that association network around the world. And I've already used that in another investigation uh, many, many miles from, from the UK um, to provide us with some assistance. So I think there was a lot of value. Trish, um, sorry, Tash asks, um, how did you become the head of major crime and what inspired you to be a police officer? Um, right, two very diverse questions there. So inspired to be a police officer, that sense of wanting to help people and having a career that, you know, every day would be different that kind of adventure and excitement that I talked about before. That was my inspiration behind it. I also remember actually some, some beat officers um, in, uh, on the farm that I grew up on, um, always being kind of uh, interested in what you were doing, and I was kind of quite intrigued by their job from uh, a young age. The second part of the story was about... Um, what um, inspired you to become a police officer? So that's the police officer. And then I think there was a question about uh, major, major crime. crime. Um, how, what, did I, how did you become the head of Yeah, so, um, so I've been a detective superintendent for five years. Uh, worked, uh, had a couple of jobs before that, uh, working in counter-corruption and working in counter-terrorism. When the head of major crime role came up, um, I was very, very keen to make my uh, interest known that I was keen on this role in particular, having worked in major crime before. Um, this is a kind of a real passion of mine. So um, then it comes down to a, you know, the, the chief constable and the senior team uh, selecting somebody to do that role. Holly asks, um, what motivates you throughout the horrific things that you see and, and, and do in the major crime? Um, two things. Justice. Supporting the family. That's what it's about. We can't have people getting away with the most serious crimes. Um, delighted that we solve over 95% of those, of course. We'd always like it to be 100%. Of course we would. Um, but getting justice is really, really important. That's good for good for the family, it's good for the community that it's happened in, and it's good for wider society as well. We've got a couple of um, silly questions, if you're up for answering those. Um, sure. Nick has asked, um, would you rather uh, fight a honey badger or five large chickens? Wow. Um, so the policing side of me says, um, I'm head of major crime, we don't want violence, why do I need to fight them in the first place? So I've got that going on in my mind. Um, the second part is, as a runner, um, can I outrun them if I needed to? But then people watching would say, well, why are the police running away? Um, a honey badger, um, I think, is quite a, a, an angry animal. Uh, I'd probably take the chickens if I had to. Um, and a question from Jim. I think this is related to football. Um, do you prefer 4-4-2 or 4-3-3? Uh, uh, yes, right, football. Uh, uh, why be so inflexible, Jim? Um, there's somewhere in between there, but 4-3-3 three, three probably. Um, Sam asks, what's the best um, advice that you had in your career? Best advice? Um, best advice was um, be a good listener, be kind and be caring. That's really important to me. Uh, and another bit of advice that I've always borne in mind, I hope I've borne in mind, uh, be kind to the people on the way up because you might just meet them on the way down. And she's got an assessment in two weeks, she says. So okay. is there anything else you can ad advise her for that assessment? So if you're doing a police assessment, um, or actually any young person going for an interview, um, I would say show personality. Um, employers, managers, leaders, um, they really want people that uh, are keen to learn, will work hard, are ambitious, but are sensible, are good communicators, and they care. You know, all of that, those skills, whether you're going to be a police officer or work somewhere else, um, I think they're just good life skills and behaviours to have. So, but very best of luck. Thank you for all your questions. This is ends part one, but join us in about five minutes for part two, where we're going to look at how detectives investigate murder.